Hello everyone and welcome to Friday Message. We'll begin with a prayer. It's one of my favorite prayers uh, from the prayers and thanksgiving sections of the prayer book. It is for the human family. Let us pray. O God, you have made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to share one of my all-time favorite stories with you for this Friday message. It was told by a seminary professor of mine named John Shea, who is a marvelous storyteller. And I remember him telling this story. Um, it was within the first days that um, um, I, was, I, I had gone to seminary. I think we were on some kind of retreat days as preparation as first year students. And he told this story and it's always stuck with me and always been one of my favorites. It's an old story and you'll be able to tell how old it is because of its, um, some of the, the things that it says in here. But um, the story is entitled The Cigar Smoker. The kingdom of God is like a cigar smoker without his cigar. The cigar smoker was giving a workshop in Los Angeles. It began in glory and ended in humiliation. At the close, people were grumbling and his departure was more in the nature of an escape. But as the cab dragged through the traffic to the airport, he thought to himself, if only I can get to the airport, get on the plane, nurse a double martini, eat whatever lousy food the airline is serving, that's an indication it's an old story, and smoke my cigar, that's an indication this is a really old story, everything will be all right. For this was many years ago when cigar smoking on airplanes was allowed. For the first time in three days there were no hitches. He got to the airport, got on the plane, and plunked himself down in an aisle seat in the smoking section. Next to him in the middle seat was a little girl around four years old. She had with her everything little girls carry on airplanes, a half-eaten bag of Fritos, a coloring book with a box of crayons, and a doll must from too much hugging and squeezing. In the window seat sat the little girl's mother. Los Angeles, as usual, was socked in a, in a thick mixture of fog and smoke. As the plane left the ground, it entered the thick gray clouds. The cabin darkened, but the plane climbed. But as the plane climbed, the cabin grew progressively lighter until the dazzling moment when the plane broke out of the clouds into the sun. The captain turned off the no smoking sign. The woman in the window seat lit up a cigarette. When the cigar smoker looked over at her, his heart sank. As she exhaled the smoke, she waved her hand back and forth in front of her mouth. The smoke wafted upward and drifted toward the front of the cabin. The cigar smoker instantly knew what this meant. This woman was going to smoke her cigarette, but there was going to be no smoke in the little girl's eyes. But the cigar smoker also knew that when he lit up his cigar, smoke would swirl through the cabin, infiltrate the cockpit, and seep out into the universe. And if he lights up his cigar, this little girl would be engulfed in smoke. She would be coughing her pathetic little girl cough. People would be staring angrily at him. He would be the bad guy of all time. The cigar smoker folded his arms and allowed the injustice of it all full reign over his soul. His thoughts boiled. Did he not get a seat in the smoking section? He did. Do, you al are, do they allow you to smoke cigars in the smoking section? They do. Does he need a cigar? Oh, sweet Lord, he needs a cigar. Will he be allowed to smoke a cigar? He will not. 
He sank sullenly into the seat and entertained the idea of locking the little girl in the washroom. The woman in the window seat finished her cigarette and said to the little girl, Jennifer, come over. She helped Jennifer slide over and sit on her lap. Jennifer, the mother instructed her, look out at the clouds. Jennifer looked out the window of the airplane and looked down at the clouds. The little girl immediately began to sob and repeat in a frightened voice, we're upside down, we're upside down. The cigar smoker turned toward the noise and coolly observed the little girl's panic. He thought to himself, all her life this little kid has been standing on the ground looking up at the clouds. Now she's over the clouds looking down. She naturally thinks she's upside down. But he decided that it was not his place to say anything. Jennifer's mother was the soul of logic. She explained to her, we're in an airplane, Jennifer. When you're in an airplane, you go up in the air. When you go up in the air, you go over the clouds. So you see, we're not upside down. We are right side up. And then from the mother's mouth came a conclusion that she was obviously not prepared to admit, but which she could not avoid. The clouds are upside down. To which Jennifer rep replied, her sobs deepening, we're upside down, we're upside down. The mother pressed the button for the cabin attendant, and down the aisle came a trained and confident stewardess, prepared for any eventuality. She leaned over the cigar smoker and said in a voice of syrup to the little girl, what's your name? Jennifer, the girl whippered. What's the matter, Jennifer? We're upside down. No, we're not, honey, flight attendant assured her. Then she talked about her experience of flying, and that sometimes she gets afraid too, but that really there is nothing to worry about because the captain knows what he is doing, and what she finds often helps is some Coca-Cola and some peanuts, and that she was going to get some and bring them back to her, and then she would see that there was no reason to cry. The cabin attendant retreated down the aisle, smiling. Jennifer sobbed. We're upside down. We're upside down. Jennifer's mother, leaving reason, resorted to discipline. She picked the little girl off her lap and planted her firmly back in the middle seat. Sit there and be good. Jennifer sat there, holding her thin knees and making soft crying noises that anyone with an ear to hear could pick up. The cigar smoker heard. He leaned over to the little girl and said, Jennifer, you are upside down. The little girl looked up at him in grateful recognition. But it's okay, the cigar smoker said. It's okay. Jennifer climbed over the arm of the seat and sat in the cigar smoker's lap. And for a moment before her mother could rescue her, for one dazzling moment comparable to when an airplane breaks out of the darkened clouds into the sun, the cigar smoker knew he really didn't need the cigar. Jesus came to proclaim the upside down kingdom of God. Indeed, Jesus came to turn the world upside down. From the, some of the first moments in the Gospel of Luke, in Mary's Magnificat, she proclaims, God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, cast down the mighty from their thrones, and lifted up the lowly. The Beatitudes proclaim, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn and the meek and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and the merciful and the pure in heart and peacemakers. Turning the world upside down, those Beatitudes. In Luke, Jesus reads from Isaiah in the temple about bringing good news to the poor and release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, turning the world upside down. 
It's an upside down kingdom where those who had been pushed to the margins were now invited in, welcomed, lifted up, and embraced by the Son of God. What a vision. What a revelation. The upside down kingdom. It's like the light breaking through when an airplane breaks out of the clouds and into the sun. Indeed, it is the light of the sun, the good news of the sun, S-O-N, the good news of the Son of God, God's upside down kingdom. A few announcements coming up if you're uh, seeing this on Friday, coming up tomorrow on Saturday, the October 2nd. We're having our blessing of the animals right out here in the parking lot. You need to come in off of Dunlop. The parking lot is blocked off now for the work uh, on the pavers. So for the pet blessing on Saturday and for services on Sunday, you'll need to enter from Dunlop. The uh, handicapped accessible spaces in the front of church will still be open and you can use them but otherwise you are not able to come through, so come in off of Dunlop both on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, there will be uh, handicap spots available toward the front here where we're set up for the service at 10 a.m., brief service at 10 a.m., and uh, then we will have a walk-up or drive-through blessing of the animals between 10.20 and noon, so come anytime uh, in that window between 10:20 and noon, you're welcome to bring a donation for Crow. Our friends from Crow are going to be here, and uh, they're receiving donations. You can get a list of the items uh, from the website. Blessing of the animals tomorrow morning. Service starts at 10 a.m. Don't forget about our Zoom social hour, 11:45 on Sunday. The link can be found in the brief here. Uh, we will be blessing pets virtually this Sunday on the third. So if you're not able to make it on Saturday, come on to the Zoom on Sunday and we'll, I'll be doing a virtual blessing of the animals during Zoom social hour. And then just a reminder about uh, porch visits. I'm doing porch visits with up to six people right out here on the preacher's porch. Informal get to know you kinds of gatherings. The next two are coming up Tuesday, October 19th at 8.30 a.m. Tuesday, October 19th at 8.30 a.m. or Thursday, October 21st at 5 o'clock p.m. You can call Susan and reserve a spot with her for one of those porch visits. Be safe and well, and God bless you.